I'm the co-chair of the Berkeley Network for the New Political Economy, along with Steve Vogel. Um, today, we are uh, having a wonderful presentation on uh, gender and political economy. One of the things we decided last uh, year when we got this money was to try to uh, create sessions that would bring together scholars um, who were um, still looking at political economy, but combining different perspectives. And today is uh, one of those sessions. I wanna tell everybody today that we are recording this and we are going to record um, the questions and the answers um, to the, uh, in the discussion. And so if you uh, feel uncomfortable uh, having yourself identified, please use the uh, chat function to give us questions. Um, if you'd like to go ahead and talk, we're happy to have that, but we are gonna record and we'll post this uh, on our website um, at the end. So having said that, let me go ahead and get, let me, with no more wasting of time, let me go ahead and, and open the session. Uh, today, as I said, we're going to be discussing gender and political economy. And uh, I want to introduce uh, Thara Gonzalez, who is a graduate student in the sociology department. Uh, Thara does work on the emergence and circulation of gender classifications in the United States and globally. And she has uh, two publications coming out, one in social forces and one in gender and society. Thara is going to moderate our discussion today, and she'll introduce uh, Rock Ray and Leslie Salzinger, our speaker. Thara, yours. Thanks, Neil, and um, thanks to everyone for, for gathering here to talk about um, for this conversation on gender and the political economy. So this week's discussion follows the last session on race and the political economy. Um, and the session is really well scheduled, and we'll build on some of the conversations from last week because both of our speakers for today, Raka Ray and Leslie Salzinger, take seriously the ways that gender shapes and is shaped by political and economic processes, but also the way these processes are mediated by race, nationality, and class. Um, we had a great conversation a few days ago in anticipation of today's session, which traveled from the ways in which we might define political economy and its relation to gender, how to th think about gendered political economies in a comparative and global context, and the ways that the current crisis of COVID has brought to the fore the gendered under underpinnings of the political economy. Um, so I really look forward to seeing where the conversation leads today. And now I'm gonna introduce our speakers. Raka Ray is a professor of sociology, professor of South and Southeast Asian studies and Dean of social sciences at UC Berkeley. Her scholarship engages feminist and post-colonial theory with India as an empirical case. Her past empirical projects have examined the women's movement in India in a book titled Fields of Protest, um, as well as the relations between domestic workers and employers in West Bengal and New York in a book titled Cultures of Servitude. Her current work examines how aspirations among lower middle class young people are patterned by gender and urbanicity within India's neoliberal economy. Leslie Salsinger is a sociologist and associate professor and vice chair in Berkeley's gender and women's studies department. Her work examines the co-constitution of gender and capitalism in a comparative and transnational context. <coughs> and her first book, Genders in Production, looked at the gender dimensions of transnational factory production by examining life inside Maquiladoras near the US-Mexico border. Her current work examines peso dollar exchange markets in Mexico and the US as crucial raced and gendered sites for Mexico's shift from developing nation to emerging market. And with that, I'll turn it over to Leslie. Hello, everybody, and thank you. And thank you so much to Steve and Neil for just organizing this amazing set of conversations about political economy, to Richard for doing so much work on it, um, and to Thada for, for getting you know, Raka and I organized and introducing us. Um, and you know, I think it's, it's so lucky to be able to do this talk with Raka as we were Talking about what we would say, I realize we've had so many years of this conversation. Um, and so it's kind of fun to do it in a more formal context. I, I wanted to start by saying that I feel like this is a, an unnervingly appropriate moment to have this particular conversation. The issues are interesting anytime, but the world this intersection illuminates right now is such a distressing one. There are so many points of intersection between political economy and gender. We know that the economy produces and works through gendered and racialized differences across arenas. 
It operates in the production of inequality, in the leveraging of sexism and racism in setting wages, in the harnessing of all our identities and establishing managerial control, in fueling and legitimating financial markets through masculinized discourses. That is, across multiple realms, gender and race are incited and evoked, and these differences then become the basis of accumulation. And I'd be happy to talk about any of those issues during the discussion. But today, in the middle of COVID, as I talk to all of you through my screen to protect our very bodily integrity, it's the issue of the production of people, of how humans are made and remade, birthed, developed, re replenished, and cared for on a daily and generational basis which seems most problematic, most important, and most in need of analysis through a feminist and materialist lens. Given that, I'm gonna talk less about gendered people and more about how gender as a normative ideal structures the economy as a whole. I'm gonna do that by thinking about what Marx's feminists call social reproduction, a claim about the necessary economic moment of the production and reproduction of the human within capitalism and the gendered structuring of those processes. I think much of the analysis of the economy from neoclassical economists through Marxist analysis is organized around a set of structuring gendered assumptions that are often not articulated. That the economy is comprised of the work we do for money and of the buying and selling of its fruits. That production and the making of things matters more than and analytically precedes the reproduction and the making of people. And that understanding these fundamental dynamics requires assuming that individuals are embedded in these structures as some kind of rational self-interested actors and that we can infer their actions accordingly. I think a feminist view really shifts all these assumptions and thus allows us to see the present flipped, highlighting processes of unpaid and underpaid social reproduction and the complex emotional dynamics of care. That is by making visible and problematizing the gender division of labor between those who work and those who care, we can better understand both how gender structures the economy and the contemporary social disaster of our handling of the pandemic. I want to start thinking this through not directly with the feminized and racialized realm of social reproduction, however, but first by turning our attention to the other side, to the masculine subject purported to inhabit what counts as the economy. Here we find the figure Joe Knacker calls the abstract worker and who neoliberal economists lionized as homo economicus, rational man. Supposedly ungendered figures, their very existence, I will argue, is normatively masculine, premised on the existence of a feminine other who makes his social and emotional existence possible. We can highlight first Acker's abstract worker, someone fully available without fail, eight hours a day, who can dispose of their labor without constraint, who echoing Marx's free laborer is the sovereign of his labor power, able to promise delivery of attention and energy without fail. This person of course is not responsible for others. Anyone who does dependent care of the young, the old, the sick is not free to promise 100% availability. Now, of course, none of us are. As humans, our bodies are fallible, but the fiction of fully available labor is a gendered one central to the operations of our economy and buttressed by a gendered and raised familial infrastructure that I'll talk about shortly. That is, I think one thing that's important about this whole gendered story is that it ends up being problematic not only for women, but also for men, because nobody in fact can fit this entirely. Now, neoliberalism, the period of capitalist relations we've inhabited with ever increasing intensity since the early 70s, similarly has a central masculinized agent, homo economicus, not the worker, but the choosing agent, allocating his human capital rather than his labor, but similarly unhindered by primary obligations to others. This figure sitting in isolation, individually, necessarily self-interestedly, weighing his options, is often discussed in gender neutral terms. After all, to work in one's own self-interest is a fundamental aspect of economic action, as we consider which job we take, which product we buy, weighing costs and benefits, and choosing the options that best suit. However, that figure is not ungendered. To the contrary, it's premised upon a gendered infrastructure. Rational decisions are necessarily disembedded from social relations of care, from the needs and desires of others, from the responsibilities of care more generally. 
For one person to only care about his own rational choices, someone else has to look behind, lurk behind, picking up the pieces of emotion, desire, and obligation to others. That is, both the abstract worker and the rational chooser are normatively masculine figures, premised on the heteronormative family in which emotions and the obligations of care are allocated by gender, in so doing enabling a larger economic structure which can take work for granted and so knowingly disregard this work for granted and so knowingly disregard its operations. Of course, we know empirically that most mothers are working for pay as well as for free. We know that increasingly much of that work of care is commodified and done by people marked by race as well as by gender and is done by women who often do double duty as paid labor as well as unpaid. But it is precisely the normative underpinnings of that social form that assume a masculine figure not so encumbered that make possible the split between production and reproduction and hence to return to our theme to capital's capacity to wash its hands of the responsibility for social reproduction. That is the very figure of the masculine agent, whether as full-time worker or choosing subject, is made possible by the fiction that social reproduction is happening elsewhere, automatically taken care of in another, less significant and necessarily feminized realm. So now I wanna to turn to that realm. The term social reproduction first emerged in the 70s and 80s in the work of the wages for housework and Marxist feminist theorists. Focused on the work it takes to make and remake people, these activist scholars located an essential dynamic of capitalist accumulation in the production rather than the exploitation of labor power. Insofar as capitalism depends on the production, not only of stuff, but of the people who make it, they argued, the gendered and raced apparatus of reproduction was a fundamental part of what makes exploitation possible. Under capitalism, this labor has generally been done, at least in part by wives and mothers for free, and often and increasingly supplemented by the quasi or unfree labor of feminized racialized others. Since profits under capitalism are mediated by the difference between the cost of making workers and the market value of the production of their, their labor produces, the cost of social reproduction, kept down through the intersection of patriarchy and white supremacy, is fundamental, as in the process, as in the production of widgets, the set of costs, as well as those who as well as who bears them, is determined by local processes of management and control. That is, households too have a labor process, which implies particular levels of extraction. In this case, most fundamentally organized by gender and race rather than directly through class relations. This puts historically specific structures of social reproduction at the heart of the economy, setting a level of accumulation itself. One of the distinctive features of reproductive labor it is, that it is not truly free labor. Under capitalism, workers are free in the sense that their relationship with any individual employer is voluntary, even though the need to do paid work at all is not. Clearly in this framework, women's labor in heteronormative households is not free labor. It is very much related to a particular agent of patriarchy. What's more, the cultural expectations around mothering are inherent in being a mother. There are no choices involved. In this sense, neither mothering nor wiving is free labor. The work is inherent in the person herself. Within capitalism, wages make labor intelligible as labor. So the wages for housework theorists, although they were much mocked for the literal money-grubbing implications of the phrase that defined the movement, were actually saying something much more complex. The problem they identified was the naturalized coding and invisibility of reproductive labor as labor. So their response to argue for wages was not actually to charge by the hour, but to make women's private labor visible through the language of capital. This ideological strategy was necessary, they argued, in order to respond to the naturalized form taken by women's private labor, in which housework was presented as intrinsic to the womanly self and then doubly mystified by the rhetoric of love, which, as they said, masked the macabre face of exploitation. Focused on heteronormative families, on motherhood and heterosexuality and housework, they argued that women were coerced and duped into the devalued labor of caring for their families, approximately by their partners, but ultimately in the service of a system which fed on the profits generated by their husbands' profit generating labor power. Their goal then was to break this naturalized sentimental coercion and make the work visible as the labor it was.
As more and more women engage in paid work along with the work of family, especially among normative white and middle-class families, these, one might wonder if this earlier image of women's obligatory familial role still holds. After all, Fordism is a normative white patriarchal family is history now, and in neoliberalism, it is every boat on its own bottom. In the US today, nearly 30% of adults live alone. As I said earlier, neoliberalism's homo economic, homo economic protagonist is the risk-taking entrepreneur off on his own, rationally calculating his personal self-interest. Unless we think this is only for men, we note the end of welfare in the 1990s was argued even by some feminists in the period as justified by women's necessary modern independence from men and by analogy from the state. You know you're really in a gendered mess when poor women of color are supposed to inhabit white masculinity but without the freedom that would make that possible. But even for men, scratch a risk taker, find a family. Especially as the state steps back, families become all the more essential. Margaret Thatcher's infamous comment, who is society, there is no such thing. There are individual men and women is in fact followed by another clause, clause which is less often left out and there are families. This is often left out, but it is an essential element in her argument. Neoliberalism's boastful risk-taking entrepreneur still has a secret safety net, the family at attention below, ready to catch him if he falls. Today, as the COVID-19 pandemic rages across the globe, and especially across the US, the secret is out. The virus has brought the family safety net into plain set and we see it is full of holes. News accounts are full of cute anecdotes about children popping up in Zoom work sessions, but then it gets less cute. Fathers claim they're sharing homeschooling 50-50, but mothers beg to differ, suggesting that perhaps fathers don't even grasp what the whole job might be is why they think they're doing half when they're only doing like 10%. Working women with children home report their goal is just survival. Florida State University said WIP workers weren't allowed to care for children while working remotely and mothers exploded in response. In the pandemic's early days, an article headlined in the COVID economy, you can have a kid or a job, but you can't have both went viral. And multiple anecdotal accounts of how the pandemic is undermining the employment gains women have made over the last two decades has been substantiated by studies reporting that women's work hours have fallen four to five times more than their husbands as paid childcare has vanished. Whether this is because their wages are lower than their husbands or because to care for children stuck at home is a mother's job, these are gender processes. The tattered safety net emerges and it turns out not to be the state or the rational individual. Instead, it is again and still women in the family picking up the pieces. Mothering isn't work and it is not, mothering is work, but it is not optional. The unfree nature of this work is once again apparent. Women don't choose this work. It is part of the territory of being a woman inherent in the feminized self. As the pandemic brings physical survival to the center of our attention, and the fragile infrastructure that enabled even mothers to perform free labor collapses, reproductive labor becomes visible as the underlying obligatory work that makes all the rest possible or not, as the case may be. Part of what creates the stress situations we see in homes right now, of course, is that under normal circumstances in the present, mothers are not doing all that reproductive labor themselves. To the contrary, even as the family's importance as a backstop to disaster has grown under neoliberalism, racialized transnational labor increasingly supplements women's unpaid reproductive work. In the US, roughly 70% of mothers and 90% of fathers of school-aged children were in the paid workforce in 2016. And although black women have always worked more than white, the proportion of both groups in the paid workforce grew sharply in the 50s and even more dramatically after 1970. As women and men alike work more hours across the race and class structure, paid reproductive labor outside the home has skyrocketed to supplement family care and intimate attention is increasingly stratified by class, race, and place. As a result, food preparation, cleaning, elder care, child care are ever more intensively commodified thus outsourcing the work of survival, even as its complex coordination generally remains in the hands of women and families. Neoliberalism is often recognized as a shift in the boundaries between public state and private capital, 
But we see a similar move border movement in the realm of social reproduction, as much of the work of care is commodified and moved into the market. Neoliberalism restructures reproduction as well as production. Everyone works more hours for pay, and the re resources allocated to the work of producing and re reproducing people is increasingly transnationally produced and unequally distributed. Into this overextended patchwork system of social reproduction intrudes the virus, undermining the finely tuned rhythm of family care arrangements. Schools and childcare centers have closed around the country in the face of the pandemic. Childcare and teaching centers have shut down. Nursing homes are locked down, allowing no one in or out and still ravaged by disease. So for families who could manage have brought older relatives into their home. Daily child care work workers and home health aides who care for elderly patients are deemed possible disease vectors and laid off. Restaurants are closed. More men are helping with child care and housework and thus becoming more aware of what that work takes now that they're stuck at home with their families all day. But women are still picking up the pieces. Families are on their own and everyone is grappling with the amount of work this takes. These days, the frazzled terrain of social reproduction is in full view and it is not a pretty sight. Homes are stressed, but truly in the eyes of the viral storm are paid reproductive care workers. Newly extolled as heroes, they find themselves responsible for the public work of feeding and caring for others. Healthcare, groceries, and other food services, residential and private care work are all involved in maintaining people on a daily basis, and all are defined as essential in executive orders during the pandemic. Not surprisingly, these workers are mostly women of color. They earn well below the US median income. U.S. has a notoriously inadequate welfare state, but even in the U.S. as COVID-19 hit, unemployment benefits were made widely available to laid off workers as people were asked to stop going out to work and stay home in the interests of community safety. All that is except essential workers, that is essential workers who were allowed to continue working and hence not eligible for state support if they chose to shelter in place. As the virus emerged as a life-threatening force and the state stepped in to forestall total economic collapse by providing unemployment benefits for laid off workers, the irony that doing essential work meant not having the option to stay home was stark. With no new jobs available and no access to unemployment, being lauded as essential during the pandemic has meant being stuck to one's job. In that sense, essential workers, like mothers in another register, are no longer free labor. This acknowledged element of coercion has been, this unacknowledged element of coercion has been paired in another disturbing echo of mothering with waves of praise and admiration. Essential workers are heroes, childcare and teaching are hard, being a nurse is brave, selling groceries is a service to the community. Around the country, grateful adults and gleeful children stood at windows, although this of course stopped by now, and on front stoops, clapping and banging pots every night at seven in honor of essential workers. It is striking how, even when commodified, the unholy duo of love and devaluation continues to shroud reproductive labor, further intensified by its simultaneous racialization. Sociologists and organizers alike have repeatedly identified these dynamics in care work as child and elder care workers are expected to treat their work as a labor of love, even as these jobs don't legally qualify for overtime or normal, normal minimum wage protections, and much of the work is done in the shadow of the formal economy overall. What's so striking about the current moment is to see this twinning echo around the realm of care work and into uh, leave the realm of care work and move into mi what Mignon Defi what Mignon Duffy calls non-nurturant reproductive labor, such as cleaning, cooking, and food preparation. So the gro grocery store clerks without masks, nurses without PPE, pointed out they'd signed up for a job, not a death sentence. In response, they are called heroes and kept at work. In a telling echo of motherhood, essential workers find themselves simultaneously coerced, unprotected, underpaid, and sacralized. Life is a precondition and sometimes a byproduct of capitalism, but the system itself is organized for profit. To see in, with, and through the pandemic is to wonder about human survival within that logic. Neoliberalism, capitalism's signature enticements of autonomy and freedom have little resonance in the realm of social reproduction. Instead, obligation and love are the coin of the realm. The disease has made evident anew that autonomy depends on community and freedom on love and obligation. 
but we are only supporting the first part of those equations. Just as the purely self-interested, disembedded, disembedded and disembodied homo economicus is a gendered and racialized fiction, so is the image of formal exploitation as a self-sufficient process. Capitalist exploitation is a parasite. Social reproduction is its host. And right now that host is not thriving. Seeing the consequences of this in the brutal light of the pandemic pushes us to ask, how might the arena of social reproduction look if it was not organized to feed exploitation, but instead to nourish its, its occupant? Might the pandemic push us to center human flourishing? When we ask how gender informs our understanding of political economy, this is what it shows us. When we foreground not women or men, but the gendered and racialized structuring of the economy itself, we can see both the untenability of the current system and of the way it is made and remade in and through gender as a structure. If we're to rethink the current burgeoning levels of inequality, the full on unsustainability of the current system, we'll only be able to do so if we see and challenge the way it produces and works off of gendered and racialized difference and so keeps us all stuck in place. Thanks. Should I just start? Okay. So um, let me add my thanks to Leslie's. Uh, thank you for this invitation, Neil, Steve, Richard, and above all, Tara. My comments will um, build on Leslie's in many ways. Unsurprisingly, we have many observations in common. So I've been scratching out as she's been talking. <laughs> and so I'm gonna shorten my comments a little bit and that will leave room for discussion. That will make everybody happy. So I want to begin though by making three observations about what incorporating gender into political economy adds to the analysis of political economy. And these are all things that Leslie has referred to. So first, a political economy of gender begins with the premise that the heterosexual family should not be assumed to be a unit, that men and women have different power relations within the family and that they have different relationships to the labor market. Okay. But it extends further into an understanding that the gendered division of labor and gendered ideas, the norms Leslie referred to, so who does what, who should do what, who is rewarded for doing what, who is punished for doing what. These have all been central to the functioning of uh, economies and homes, in fact, to many of the institutions of society. And this includes what V. Spike Peterson calls gender as a governing code or what Joan Scott refers to as the discursive power of gender with regard to concepts such as production, work, rationality, etc. In short, gender shapes the power relationships between labor and capital. And there are, of course, the more thoughtful, necessary intersectional versions of this. Finally, to engender an economy, as it were, or to engender the concept of exploitation necessarily involves the inclusion of feelings. For it is the cultivation of feelings such as love, gratitude and obligation that enables certain forms of labor to be invisible or minimally paid. As such then, to bring political economy and gender together is also to bring emotions and political economy together. So what I want to do in my remarks today is to work through a concrete example, that of COVID in India, to lay out the complex interweaving of multiple inequalities and culture in this time. Um, the lockdown, India was put under lockdown and, and, and goes in and out of lockdown. The lockdown and the pandemic are what anthropologist Veena Das has called critical events. They're sort of cataclysmic moments in collective life that lay bare the structures of everyday life. The public health response to the COVID-19 pandemic has brought home the particular significance of home as a cultural construct, as Leslie referred to, and the role of that home in political economy. Leslie has spoken about the US and let me describe the processes for India. And we'll see that just as in India, we see a combination of race uh, just as in the US, we see a combination of race, class, and gender in play to order the household and to undergird the economy. We have caste, class, and gender in, at play in India within the parameters of a different political economy. Okay. <clears throat> 
So in response to the pandemic, the Indian government announced on 24th of March, 2020, that a 21 day total lockdown would start within four hours. It eventually became a 40 day lockdown, but everybody was given four hours in which to get ready for it. I want to focus on what those 40 days laid bare. During those days, people were banned from stepping out of their homes, except to buy essential supplies. So you could go to the hospital, you could go to the pharmacy, you could go to a grocery store. All places of work, private and public offices, shops and factories, schools and colleges, restaurants and theaters were closed. Public transportation was stopped. That's a lockdown. For affluent and middle-class households, the panic induced by the pandemic was compounded by the prospect of managing housework without paid domestic workers. The conventional modern middle-class household with the husband-wife dyad at its center is actually a menage a trois. Essential to its smooth functioning is the presence of the domestic worker to whom most chores are consigned as Simi Kayum and I have written about in our book, Cultures of Servitude. In that book, we argued that it was domestic workers who allowed middle-class women to be modern women in India so they could go out and work because much of the labor of social reproduction within the household could be transferred to working class female wage earners. The prevalence of deep-seated caste and class inequality and widespread poverty has created a large pool of working class women to whom middle class housework can be assigned. Thus, the question of gender inequality within the middle class household has been indefinitely deferred by class privilege with paid workers helping to paper over potential conjugal conflict. The tagline of a recent pre-COVID site to hire domestic workers in Mumbai, bookmybuy.com, says, diamonds are useless, gift your wife a maid. With the lockdown, perhaps for the first time in modern India, domestic workers were suddenly taken out of this equation. Deprived of house cleaners, cooks, nannies and nurses, middle-class men and women, most confined to work from home, were forced to confront a mountain of chores and the inequality of their relationship. By most accounts, just as in the US, middle-class women took up most of the slack created by the absence of domestic workers, stretching to fit in tasks while men helped out by going to do the shopping, thus reaffirming the gender divide between the home and the world. Just parenthetically, I want to say that as Dean, the stories of desperation from young faculty with children has been extraordinarily painful, especially when you read the data on the dramatic fall in the productivity of, uh, of uh, academic women. We could certainly talk about that later. But back to India. For mothers with children confined at home, for women particularly in multi-generational families with both children and in-laws demanding attention, amusement, or assistance with online classes, lockdown has been especially onerous. While thousands of women, middle-class women, reported feeling resentful and exhausted, and some took to social media to claim half seriously that disagreements and tensions would drive them to divorce, most only wished fervently for the lifting of lockdown and the return of their domestic workers. In the meantime, what of the domestic workers themselves during the lockdown? Although the government had urged employers to pay workers during this period, only a tiny proportion actually did. For domestic workers, the announcement of the lockdown on March 24th and the sudden suspension of employment came as a shock. Most experienced an immediate crisis in making ends meet. Working class women's paid work in middle class households stabilized the income of their own households. You see, women's salaries are often more reliable than the irregular jobs that their men found on construction sites, peddling rickshaws in small trades and street vending. These men and women 
have by and large migrated from rural India in order to make ends meet. With no income given four hours notice, they started to return to their villages. Hundreds of thousands of desperate people started to walk home, trudging thousands of miles in killing heat, pulling along and carrying their children, their possessions bundled on their heads and under their arms, their mouths parched and their bellies empty, aching bodies and blistered feet, the biggest exodus that India has seen since the partition of the country in 1947. They were returning to their homes in rural India. Now, almost half of all Indians still depend on agriculture. But of that, 56% of them have no agricultural land. So a precarious agrarian economy and the absence of basic amenities in rural areas have forced more and more Indians to move to cities and towns, traveling vast distances across states in search of remunerative work. From these cities, they sent money back to prop up rural India. Now remember, it is the women who, though low-waged, had the more stable incomes from, and they had these incomes from working for middle-class households. As with the case of the terrible photograph of the dead Syrian toddler, Indians were shocked by a video of a baby playing peekaboo behind the sari of his mother as she lay dead on the railway platform. Middle-class Indians asked, how have we come to be so callous? But callousness does not capture the essence of the phenomenon where dehumanization is a prerequisite in such stark inequality. To understand this more fully, we need to draw in cultures of caste into this classed and gendered culture of exploitation. Ingrained into the habitus of every upper caste Indian is the notion of pollution. Within the caste system, pollution is closely tied to bodily substances, hair, saliva, excreta, menstrual blood. Those who deal with polluting substances are by association deemed to be polluted and therefore dangerous since they can pollute others. Thus, the very people who earn a living from cleaning upper caste homes and from washing the bodies of upper class children and the elderly, workers who remove the dirty products of upper caste bodies are themselves rendered, rendered dirty and polluting. Their labor is needed, yet their dangerous bodies must be distanced from upper caste ones. They are abject, their proximity revokes, provokes revulsion and rejection. The argument made by Judith Butler and McClintock and others in the context of race and gender applies to the caste class dynamic of exploitation and exclusion operating in India. Domestic workers body form the constitutive other against which the upper caste middle class understands itself. Returning to the three observations with which I started then, this critical event or the, rather the, con the combination of the pandemic and the lockdown has exposed the extent to which the heterosexual family is not a unit, that men and women have different power relationships within the family and they have different relationships to the labor market. But it also shows that gender does not work by itself but in constitutive ways with other vectors of inequality. The ideologies of the gender division of labor have sufficient power as to remain relatively unshaken despite the crisis. And this is something I'd like to talk about because Leslie also wants to know, you know, will something change? At the beginning of this crisis, there were lots of selfies that were taken with middle-class men holding brooms in their hands in the early days of the lockdown. But they were sort of ha-ha, isn't that funny moments. We also understand the extent to which a combination of caste, class, and gender builds layer upon layer of political economy on the backs of lower caste working class women. And finally, emotions. Emotions of entitlement, revulsion, and obligation that held middle-class families together and apart from the families of the working classes. <clears throat> 
So let me end there and um, turn it over or back to Tara. Thank you. Leslie and Raka, thanks to both of you for your comments. Um, they really bring out some of the conceptual and theoretical ways that feminist scholars have engaged with conventional understandings, conventional understandings of the political economy that really allied gender um, and were brought to life by some of the empirical cases that you highlighted. Um, so out of your comments, I have two sets of questions. One has to do with the ways that we might theorize social reproduction in the context of new gender and sexual formations that challenge the gender binary within relationships and families. And the other is the extent to which some of the shifts um, in public attention to care work uh, might result in sort of permanent changes in a post COVID world. Um, I'll ask both um, and you can respond to them as you like. And then uh, meanwhile, I'd invite everyone to add questions to the queue um, and I'll read them out um, um, after. So first of all, um, I'm interested in both the empirical and theoretical dimensions of a post COVID world. Um, do you think some of the shifts that we're seeing that you highlighted are permanent? So I'm thinking both of the awakenings of people to the challenges of reproductive labor, um, but also on labor force participation. That is like the decades long increasing rates of labor, labor force participation amongst middle and upper class women, which of course feeds back into expectations about reproductive labor. Um, how might we understand the relative permanence of these shifts in the comparative context in India, for instance, which has entrenched models of domestic work for a wide swath of the population, not just the upper class versus the US, where care work and domestic labor is often institutionalized for middle class families in daycares. Um, so to quote a question Leslie has raised in the forthcoming essay, in the post-COVID world, how might the arena of social reproduction look if it were not organized to feed exploitation, but instead to nourish its occupants. Um, might the pandemic push us to center human flourishing? Um, and the second set of questions um, has to do with, like I said, new sort of gender and sexual formation. So in both of your talks, you speak about the social reproduction of labor. And a lot of the theorizing depends on an opposition between men and women um, as a way of organizing gendered people my question has to do with the relationship between political, political economy and gender um, in the context of new gender categories. So this draws on the idea of the masculine subject versus the feminine subject, which, which you both referenced in your talks. According to a Pew poll, I think it was in 2017, a third of Gen Zers and a quarter of millennials say they know someone personally who uses gender neutral pronouns, and a fifth of millennials identify as LGBTQ, similar stats have come out of England and other countries. So how might we theorize gendered reproductive labor in the context of shifting understandings of gender and the way that gender operates within relationships and families where we don't have neat um, relationships defining, defined by the gender binary? Are there other axes aside from gender that would do the primary structuring work of reproductive labor? Leslie, do you want to take the first step? Let's see. I'm going to take your second one first because the reason I put the question in, well, no. I guess I'll just talk about both of them. Um, so I, I've been thinking a lot about this question of the relationship of rigid, rigid gendered categories, this, a sort of rigid version of the binary, and if the ways that that is being challenged by a younger generation, which I think is very you know, which is a real thing. I, I think it's, I don't want to dismiss that. Like how, what could be the consequences of that for what we're seeing? And I, I guess the, I'm sorry to say that I don't really know, um, but I do think that theoretically the way to think about it is to think about the way capitalism as a system consistently produces difference as a way of making profits. So I think the question will be whether sort of non-binary becomes a new category that then can be leveraged in different ways or whether it might be possible that, that the destabilization of that set of sort of formalized differences becomes um, intuitive enough to us socially that we, that, that that it in turn could destabilize some of that split between reproductive and productive labor. Because I do think ultimately the 
the, the issue for capitalism has to do with that, the, that fundamental structuring of the system and the way that gender legitimizes it over space and time. And if we really did see a fundamental structure and change in the structure of heteronormative households, I think it would have to change something about the, that division in capitalism, and that could actually lead to a real change, which is interesting. Um, but it's really, really hard to know if the sort of cultural shift among young people to towards non-binary relationships will actually lead to households that don't have that um, that same division but articulated around another set of identities. So I guess the, the sort of jury is out about where that's going. Um, I'm gonna stop with that and then I, I'd like to come back to the question of where we're going, although I'm also gonna say I don't know, but I'm, I think there are things to say about it other than that, but Rock, I'm curious what you think. Well, I think the jury is out. I also think the jury is out here. Um, you know, you can think about sort of the categories of gender, uh, gender non-binary certainly, but if you just take um, Christian Schilt's work on labor, not reproductive labor, but you know the the the, the labor force out there, and um, and look at her work on uh, trans men and trans women. What we see is they were simply slotted into uh, expectations and slots previously occupied by cis men and cis women, punished the same way, rewarded the same way uh, in in many ways. So there isn't. So I think that there is a tendency to go, I think that the power of the, of gendered ideas um, and, and a gendered difference is powerful enough so that um, people keep getting slotted into one or another instead of being seen as, uh, as this sort of gender non-binary. Um, but I don't know. I think this is this is the generation from which we will we will find out. But to follow up on something that Leslie was saying, you know, reproductive labor doesn't occur in a vacuum. You know, you have uh, the economy. You have you know one of your favorite institutions, Tara, insurance companies. You know, all of them will be weighing in on what counts, what is valued, what is to be rewarded, what is not to be rewarded. So I think that we will see once again, um, and I totally accept Leslie's uh, point that uh, capitalism builds on exploiting difference. Uh, we don't know what sets of difference um, will, be, uh, will, be, will be created, but I think they will be created. Um, to answer sort of the second question about will things change in a post-COVID world? I don't think much. It certainly will not change much in India as we have seen. Um, you know, there was a lot of writing at the beginning of the pandemic by, by you know, that I can only think like desperate wishful thinking by feminists saying, look, men are finally doing some of this housework, you know, things are going to change. But at the end of the day, all people wanted was to have their domestic workers back again. So in that sense, um, you know, there is not going to be much change. Now, change could come from the domestic workers who are in fact extremely hurt, extremely resentful that the labor they did to, to maintain and sustain all these middle-class households could be cut off like this, that nobody cared whether they ate or not. So there's a lot of anger there. But again, their bargaining power is weak. So I, I don't know. But if there is change, it will not come from the middle class families. It will come from the, 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 the workers. And I guess, um, and I guess I'll go back to sort of what I think is the main problem. It's the problem that Leslie identified. But I, to me, it is the problem that has to be shaken. And that is the definition of the worker. That, I, I think it all comes down to that. Who is a worker? What is a good worker? Until we strike at that, I think neither, you know, 
reproductive labor or nor other forms of labor will be able to be rethought and reshaped. Great. Um, let me say, I just want to say one other thing as, as Rafa was talking, I was thinking that, I mean, I guess one possible and kind of depressing outcome in the US um, in response to that first question that I was talking about would be, and I think we do see some signs of this already, not because of non-binary folks, but for other reasons, um, is that the differences that end up being exploited around reproductive versus productive labor will be racialized and not gendered, but they'll continue to be firm. So I guess that is also, that's another possible, another sort of dystopian answer would be that reproductive labor will, work, will move more fully out of the home into a sort of entirely commodified context and then be reshaped around, um, around race. Um, and I think we certainly see in the last 20 years, 30 years, we see that shift as more men of color are taking on reproductive labor jobs actually, which are certain parts of commodified reproductive labor are being done more by immigrant men. Um, and so that, that is another possibility and I think that that goes back to thinking, to posing some of these questions around the way capitalism produces difference productively, as opposed to just thinking about it in terms of gender on its own. Um, yeah, I think that's all I want to say. Great, thank you both. So we have a queue, um, and I'm going to start reading out questions. And again, if um, people want to add to their questions, feel free to unmute yourself and add after I read your question. Um, so the first is from. Catherine Aldiston. Apologies if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Um, so the question is on institutional design. Can social policy, government action, et cetera, disrupt the gendered political economy as opposed to reproduce it? For example, the CARES Act provides $511 per day benefits for employees who miss work for their own illness, but $200 a day for workers who miss work because schools, daycares are closed and they must provide childcare and zero dollars per day for workers who must miss work to care for others who are sick. The latter two categories are typically women. The last category is the one typically characterized by obligation and choice. Coincidence, could other state choices about valuing labor disrupt the dynamics you identify? Let me uh, take this first. Um, I have to believe that institutional design can make a difference because then what are we doing? <laughs> Right. I have to believe it. And, you know, obviously not institutional designs like this. But I think we realize that institutional, a good policy has to be propped up. There has to be a lot of ideological work done around a policy to make it disrupt um, sort of the, the gendered political norms, uh, the prevalent gender political norms. So we have seen, for example, uh, you know, policies like um, paid parental leave. This was a really important thing just within, within academia. Paid parental leave was a really important thing, not just maternal leave, not just, you know, but parental leave. But what a study um, has recently found, and I think probably several, but I know this one study uh, of, of economists, uh, the one study, uh, uh, yeah, several others have found is that when they come back from parental leave, women come back, you know, looking exhausted, and men come back with a book, right? So that the 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 leave policy is egalitarian. It's basically said women get to take, you know, uh, time off, men get to take time off. But what's happening with that time they're taking off is actually quite different. So. Absolutely, I have great faith that institutional, you know, like social policies have to be designed to, to change these things. But I think there has to be a lot of work around them to prop them up, to make sure that they are conventional norms. Um, yes, to everything that Raka just said. I mean, I think Katie, you and I have worked on paid family leave. I wouldn't work on it if I didn't think it mattered. Um, but I do think that it is really astonishing how often institutional changes do get folded back into the same thing, which is which returns to, to Raka's question. And there, um, to go back to Thada's original question about um, what's happening around gendered identities, I do think it is possible 
I mean, I think our generation are more likely to talk about sort of ideological shifts within those within pre existing gendered categories. And I think insofar as the sort of intuitive experiential sense of selfhood is no longer so attached to um, a binary in um, sort of sexual experiential terms, insofar as those things shift and there's actual organizing around institutions that, that maybe something would be different. But I do also feel like at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, this actually speaks to the second or maybe first question from before, um, you know, I was really thinking, wow, you know, this is a moment when all this work is visible and men are home and so they're getting to see it and everybody is getting to see what it means to not to have to do reproductive labor without commodified support for it and people are going on and on about heroes so maybe we're really going to get a change and i would say things are not looking so positive at the moment i mean you know it just looks like oh yeah so it's just like the same old people carrying more of the burden and it looks pretty depressing so i guess i would just say we also we we need movements that are really working on these issues i do think people are i'm, I'm not hopeless about it but I don't think there's any automatic way that um, that these sort of larger social changes or even institutional interventions do it on their own. You need an articulated movement. You need a fight over people's sense of self. Um, and then I think you do need, you know, somebody to work on whether how paid family leave is going to look. And then as you see its impact, you mess around with it and you see if you can actually have an. I mean, you couldn't be a social scientist or an activist without thinking that structures matter. So, yes. Um. Great, so um, we have the next question from Melina Packer, um, who says, I'm really glad you brought up emotion, Raka, and how exploitation and devaluation are disguised as love and obligation, Leslie. Um, as sociological researchers, how can we best go about, quote, measuring and otherwise naming emotion at work in asymmetrical power relations when emotion itself is so squishy and subjective, especially given how much we humans tend to internalize how we've been socialized? So I don't know exactly, uh, you know, the best answer to your question, uh, Balida. It's an important question because if we are to take emotions seriously, we have to be able to uh, operationalize it in some way. But I think perhaps what this also calls for is a sort of different ways of using um, of, of 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 asking questions, different ways of getting at at data, um, you, you know, an emotion is not often something that you're going to be able to ask about and get an answer to. So I'd actually, I think the, you know, incorporating emotions will involve, I think, uh, some pretty hard thinking about how we gain knowledge about emotions. I think that you have, we actually have to, have to, have to sort of excavate how to do it and it's not going to be easy we see you know people like uh, arlie hochschild who um really created the sociology of emotions um you know she 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 created certain theories such as feeling rules and issues things like that but not really a methodology and i don't know that there is a methodology but i do know that it, it has to be a new one. Yeah, I maybe um, the language of measuring doesn't help us with that very much. Um, even though I think that it's always, we always want to sort of do that. I think that it's it helps us think to be able to quantify things, but it, it probably takes us the wrong way. I mean, it's interesting to think about Arlie Huckshell's work in this context, because in some ways she, even though she talks about emotion, her, the, a lot of what she systematizes are the rules above it, as opposed to the, the affects themselves. And then in the humanities, people are talking about affect all the time. Um, I think it's, emotions are easier to see in their impact and then in the doing. I don't really know what to say about that, except, you know, you sort of see how, so that 
I think working ethnographically, not asking people questions, but seeing the dynamics in intimate relations are, can be more helpful. Um, to the side of that, I have to say that a, a, a term I, I love that I feel like really captures some of this in a complex way um, is this term worry work, which I, I can't remember. I can't even remember who initially defined this term, but it's a really, I think, a wonderful term to talk about the work that is done mostly by cis women in heteronormative families, but not only, um, which is not the work of actually um, even taking care of people, but the work of kind of paying attention to taking care of people, like who schedules doctor's appointments and who worries about what's going on and who, and I think that is the work that actually remains really remarkably gender stratified, even in households in which um, men and women are working the same amount, um, and even in very privileged households. And so that for me, for instance, is a concept that I think gets at something very useful that's about emotion. So sometimes I think also just like really paying attention to what's going on does help you put your finger on some dynamics that matter. Um, that's a really not a very clear answer to measuring it, but um, I think it's more the way we'll actually find out what's going on. Um, great, so our next question is from Anne, Anne Swidler, um, who says, there's a question about whether and how COVID has made visible the difference between the socialized versus privatized aspects of reproductive labor. So this is especially obvious in the role of school. So for instance, providing food and other care as well as education, the highly visible difference between those who can school their children privately and those who can't, but also access to healthcare and even the role of essential versus non-essential paid work. The question is whether the presence of a broad social challenge creates an opening for an understanding of the social nature of reproductive and indeed all labor. Sorry, could you repeat that last sentence? The last question? Sure. Um, the question is whether the presence of a broad social challenge creates an opening for an understanding of the social nature of reproductive and indeed all labor. And Anne, feel free to jump in if there's things you want to add. So I think that what I think Leslie and I both have been trying to say is it is precisely this work that COVID, that this crisis has done. It has, in fact, um, whether or not it will lead to changes, what it has done is really um, opened up the seams so that we see much more clearly the various inequalities um, under, you know, that undergird the, you know, the happy families we inhabit or the, 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 the economies we inhabit. I think that it's precisely that, that break, that, that, uh, the, 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 the fact that it had to be different all of a sudden that has that have opened up this um, uh, like just just jump in. Up and made clear the skeleton that underlies the flesh. Yeah, but I guess what's been bothering me is that so much of the discussion is about what happens inside families and that you know the social imaginary is you know women still do really all the important work and when the crunch comes, it's women who, or, you know, people who are defined as women who end up being, you know, doing the emotional labor and all the other labor. And I, from what I read in the paper, that's definitely what's true for, for children and so forth. But it seems to me that the other side of this is that what I mean by social or socialized is that, you know, public schools are not provided just by individual families. And so this, and even the maybe you can call it very fake. And I think Leslie's point was very good about, you know, essential workers turning out to be the workers who actually have no protection against having to work. But nonetheless, I think that these terms like essential workers are an attempt to make a broadly, a point about not just the social, but in some sense, the socialized. So anyway, that, that was my, I was trying to get some discussion that would push outside this imaginary of you're inside a family looking at, you know, the poor woman who's teleworking and managing her kids and the guys off, I don't know, reading the newspaper and teleworking. So it, it just that that was the the direction I was trying to. OK, I mean, maybe uh, Leslie can 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 uh, answer this question better than I can. But in all honesty, the two institutions I was thinking about were um, the economy, 
and the family. And so the point I was trying to make is that the working class woman is not just uh, working within the family or across family, but she is basically th the bottom of that pyramid on which you know layers of the economy are are, are built. So I, I would say that those are the two institutions I've thought about the most. I really can't give a very thoughtful answer about more socialized, um, either socialized challenges or socialized uh, means of existence. Uh, maybe uh, Leslie is better at that, can, can take a stab at it. Um, I don't have an answer, but I have some thoughts about it. I mean, you know, I, I do think there are a lot of people right now trying to think about more social, socialized forms in a, not at the level of the state, but kind of mutual aid and these kind of that are that are attempting to um, extend the responsibility for the reproduction of the community in an explicit kind of way and I think that's that work is very important maybe more in terms of what Rocco was talking about before in terms of the ideological fight I don't think mutual aid is going to like reshape the whole society but it does allow us to think differently about what the society is and who our obligations are to um, and to go back to KT's question earlier about institutions, um, the state, I think there are ways that one could intervene in some of the, the, way, the things that the state does to talk about that explicitly in terms of reproductive labor and extending the size of the family and so on. So we could maybe harvest some of that language um, that is, you know, so suffocatingly stuck inside the, you know, the kind of cisgendered heteronormative family and like blow it out and say, okay, what if it, what if the state was responsible for um, helping to reproduce humans and, and, and use it as opposed to, so maybe, maybe that would be helpful. Okay, um, our next question comes from um, Isabel, Isabel Cholby. Um, could all of these changes mean that more people will want to or choose to live in ways outside of the traditional family structure? Like rather than families of parents and children living in households make it made, made up of people who choose to live together on the basis of other relationships, bigger households, some other way of living, et cetera. I guess I think that's what I was just talking about in some ways. And yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think if people get themselves out of if we all got ourselves at a little heteronormative households, would be a lot. This a lot of this would be easier. I mean, it just seems that is something I think the pandemic has just made incredibly obvious that that people, everybody living in their own little bubble and not being able to get out of it is just. I mean, apart from being kind of suffocating emotionally, it's also just not that functional. And I think having the the lines around those drawn so clearly has, I think, made clear how, how how difficult that is and actually how hard it is to get out of them. I mean, the pandemic makes it biologically harder to get out of them, but I think it also, we're, we're just not that socially equipped to say, all right, let's make a bigger bubble. How do, well, how do you do that? Who do you do with? Who counts, you know? Um, but I think those forms of experiment are really, really significant and the more the better. I guess what I would add to that is, um, at the beginning of the question period, uh, Tara asked two questions, one about the changes that may result from COVID and the other um, changes from so the, a new generation, from a new generation of people who, um, who are, uh, you know, gender neutral, gender non-binary, etc. So I would disagree slightly with Leslie here. I don't think that there will be changes in patterns of socializing and household formation as a result of COVID. I, I don't see it. I certainly don't see it in India. Um, I, I, I don't really see it here. I see that people are making do and realizing that they can make do in, you know, however difficult circumstances, just seeing three people every day. Um, so I don't actually see any changes stemming from that, but I do without knowing what the changes are going to be, I do see potential changes um, coming out of the next generation. Absolutely, I do. I think that this world is, 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 is in formation. Um, it's an emergence, but I do in fact think that there will be some differences there. 
I just want to say I agree with you. Yeah, I don't, I don't actually, I don't think that the, the pandemic might provoke certain institutional changes, I think. But the more cultural changes, I think, are more likely to emerge generationally than. Because, I mean, look at what the pandemic has enabled. You know, a ferocity of cooking. You know, a ferocity of showing off the sourdough bread. Right, the, the whole, the whole, um, you know, that's all people can do. But there's really been an elevation, I think, partly because of circumstance, um, of uh, fixing the house of, of, you know, of the domestic because that's circumstance. But, um, but I think it has, is it has effects. Um, I would just add, and I realized that I sort of highlighted non-binary non-binary identities, but. I think another way in which we are already seeing shifts, and we've seen shifts over the past couple of decades in terms of family formation and gender and sexuality are of course in um, quote unquote same sex households or gay households, right? And like there you don't actually have the gender binary existing in the same form it does. And so, um, yeah, I just wanted to put that out there. Um, th this next question comes from Sharad Chari um, who says, You've both, um, thanks Leslie and Raka, you've both argued for a long time that gender is key to capitalism and you've both done this in a complex way. Um, I wonder what you both think about rethinking the foundations of capitalism in relation to the production slash co-optation of difference, both name forms and unnamed forms to come and whether we might do this by rethinking value slash devaluation. Can I add a footnote to that? Sorry, I'm jumping in. Just to say after the last response, it just struck me Raka and Leslie, that uh, some one of the things lurking here is a notion of the national economy and how intertwined it still is with that older notion of economy of the household and a particular kind of household. And therefore, the notion of value that links these scalar forms. I'm going to ask Leslie to take this one because she deals more in the concept of value than I do. I mean, I guess maybe one way to respond to this, I'm not sure if this is what you mean to raise, but I mean, the question of value, I do think, or, or the struggles over what value is, what is valued and devalued are basically, are fundamentally ideological questions. And I think um, a lot of that does have to do with this, idea of how we make of what we make visible in terms of in certain kinds of work. And so I, I think that there is plenty of work to be done in terms of revealing the actual um, labor, skilled labor as well that's involved in the making of humans as a way of sort of fighting about that. But in terms of the this and and it's interesting, I think, within that to think about like all those national accounts and things to go to your second comment, you know, where they teach the, the GDP and what counts as productive labor. So that at every level, I think you do see those echoes between um, what counts as, as productive labor and what doesn't. And so a sort of fundamental um, redefinition of what counts as productive is very important. I think in terms of capitalism, this is actually very hard and complicated because um, there isn't any, there isn't surplus in a certain sense that's extracted in, in that work. And so figuring out a way, it's a very fundamental lift to make a change that, um, that considers non, you know, formally value producing, surplus producing work as, um, as important. And so I guess I would start with how we talk about it and think about it and count it and measure it and, and hope that that would somehow ramify back to some of the fundamental operations of the system. But I don't know if that would work. And I wonder if you actually have a lurking answer. And if you do, I'd be interested in what you have to say to your own question, I mean. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the final two questions together since we only have three minutes. Um, so th the first is from Diana Reddy, um, who asks, "Is or should childcare be considered essential work?" In the early days of the pandemic, there was a lot of confusion locally about who was legally entitled to access childcare work, 
only essential workers working outside the home, only essential workers, but including those working from home, all workers as long as care was in the household. It seems interesting to me that it was never questioned that food production and preparation was essential work given a modern economy. What are we to make of this ambiguity of whether childcare is essential and for whom? And of course, what are the gender racialized and class implications of care work being essential given that it resulted in workers losing access to the choice to stay home? So that's the first question. The second, which is a great note to end on, is from Sophia Zhang, um, who asks, um, I'm interested in how people can or should practically act in order to not perpetuate these systems of oppression. I know we have just two minutes. Um, so I don't quite understand whether you think it should or, you know, is the, is the question, should child care be considered essential work or not? Um, so of course it, you know, at one level, of course it is essential work, but as is the production of food, but it, most of it is unpaid, right? Most childcare is in fact done in an unpaid way in, 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 in you know, within um, some sort of familial uh, structures. So that yes, it's essential. So this, the question is the, the difference then between essential work and essential work that must be paid. I think that's really what your this question illuminates uh, for me. Um, and Sophia, I think that people do act all the time and every day, you know, to try to uh, not perpetuate these systems in, in different ways through the people they try to vote for, through the um, through the organizations they join, through the thinking they do. You know, it's very hard, but this work is being done every day. Leslie. Last word. Um, I can say, just say briefly that I, I, I think it is interesting when childcare is or is not considered essential work. And I think that is because the question of whether um, people in households need help is necessarily always postponed by the possibility that some family member, probably a mother, will be the person who's doing it. And as Rocket said, I mean, I think it's also important for all the talk that we, I mean, today, and this, I'm certainly guilty of this, you know, I've been talking about mothers and commodified work, but actually a huge amount of childcare is done by other relatives. <laughs> and um, that's, in the pandemic, that's been especially complex because of the biology of the actual pandemic where older, older people who do a lot, who historically have done a lot of childcare for younger families, we're not able to go in. So that's a, there's another whole age structuring of this that I haven't really thought about, but that seems very important. Um, yeah, and in terms of what we can do about it, I mean, every level matters, you know, you need to vote, you need to, you know, do kind of ideological work to think about possible changes at the most intimate levels. And, and we need to talk about all those institutional kinds of things, like what does it take to actually change the way unemployment work, change the way paid family leave work, change the way social security works, all those things. And I think the only way that this will be, will, will be the, the sort of horrible intertwined um, micro macro um, stabilization of the combination of gender binary and productive reproductive labor will be undone is by a kind of simultaneous push, which I think means for all of us that whatever you do is worth it. It, it's all part of the same push and it's all important. So. And thank you everybody. Great, yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. Thanks Neil, Steve and Richard, Raka and Leslie. Thank you. <laughs>